I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous episodes of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, we looked at the letter of James. The title of that series of episodes was The Work of Faith. In that series, we learned that faith is not something that we simply profess. We have to show that we believe in the Lord Jesus by acting. That is the real faith. In this week's episode, we will be introduced to the first letter of Peter the Apostle and learn how we can have hope in the midst of suffering. In the middle of July AD 64, a great fire broke out in the city of Rome and the entire city was engulfed in flames. The fire burned for nine days, devastating two-thirds of the city, destroying temples and houses. The Roman historian Tacitus recorded that the Emperor Nero had probably set the fires in order that he might destroy the old buildings of Rome to give him room to erect marble palaces and other monuments to himself. Apparently, no matter how much he denied the charges, Nero could not shake the rumours that he was responsible for the blaze. So, to shift suspicion away from himself, Nero had to find another culprit. Since the part of the city that did not burn contained a large number of Christians, the emperor shifted the blame on them. Christians were an easy target during this time, since they were despised by so many Romans. Rome was known as a centre of pagan worship, and licentious and immoral behaviour was the norm. So the early church's refusal to embrace these practices of Roman culture was not viewed favourably. These Christ followers were viewed with suspicion, and for some in Rome, the Christian religion was seen as a danger to the very fabric of Roman culture. So, to reinforce the rumours, Emperor Nero began to persecute the Christians. It was during this time that Christians were thrown to wild animals in the arenas. They were crucified in large numbers. They were even covered in tar and burned alive as torches to light Nero's feast. As many as 5,000 Christians perished during this period until Nero's death in AD 68. The news of this persecution against God's people spread from church to church through the whole Roman Empire. But as the news spread, so too did a letter from the Apostle Peter. He wrote it to the Christians in Asia Minor, what we now call Northwest Turkey, to warn them and prepare them for the coming persecution. Peter himself was to eventually die during that same period, crucified in Rome at the hands of Nero. Jesus had predicted that he would die in this way. According to tradition, when Peter came to be executed, he requested that the cross be turned upside down, because he felt he was unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. We know a lot about the writer Peter, and his first letter is the favourite amongst Christians. In the first chapter, he tells his reader that even though they haven't seen Jesus, they loved him and had an unspeakable joy in doing so. This love for his Saviour can be seen throughout the letter. His first name was Simon. It was a common Aramaic name that means he who listens. When Jesus met Simon, however, he gave him the name of Cephas in Aramaic, or Peter in Greek. This is a less common name meaning rock indicative of the change of character in Simon that Jesus expected. Peter's character came across very clearly in the Gospels. He had considerable strengths. He was charming, eager, impulsive and energetic. But these strengths were balanced by weaknesses. He could be fickle, weak, cowardly, rash and inconsistent. He was an impulsive man with a foot-in-mouth disease, always opening his mouth and putting his foot in it but that also meant that he sometimes said wonderful things about Jesus. Many believers identify with Peter because he is so like them. Perhaps the most life-changing moment of Peter's life came after he denied Jesus three times. Just before Jesus' crucifixion, 
and then met him on the shores of Galilee after the resurrection. Imagine how humiliated Peter must have felt. Yet Jesus did not get angry with Peter or punish him for his cowardice and weakness. Jesus instead needed to be sure of one thing. Did Peter love him? This is the most important question for any believer. Do you love Jesus? Jesus asked Peter the same question three times, and this put Peter back on track. A short time later it was Peter who was preaching at Pentecost when 3,000 souls were saved and baptized. So it is not surprising that the importance of love for Jesus features so much in this letter. Peter is of course mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. Peter was definitely involved with Mark in the writing of the Gospel of Mark. In some theological circles, the Gospel of Mark is actually regarded as the Gospel of Peter. Of all the Gospels, Mark mentions Peter's weaknesses the most, and Peter's own impulsive personality shines through that Gospel. For instance, in Mark, the word immediately is used 39 times, more than any of the other Gospels. Jesus is depicted in Mark as the man of action, which is not unlike Peter. The first half of the book of Acts is all about Peter. But Peter disappears once Paul arrives on the scene. He receives a brief mention in Galatians, when Paul talks about his heated exchange concerning Peter's refusal to eat with Gentiles in the presence of Jewish believers. Peter was wrong in his behavior and Paul told him so. So we know more about Peter than any other of the apostles with the exception of Paul. This letter was written while Peter was in Rome, and he wrote it, as most scholars believe, to the exiles or the strangers in dispersion. To the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. The lack of specific details indicates that the letter was meant to be a circular letter for the believers in that region. Acts 2 records that on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, there were people from the provinces of Cappadocia, Bithynia and Pontus, which forms the eastern part of Asia Minor. Maybe there were some people from that area who were converted by Peter's first sermon, were baptized, went back home and later asked Peter to visit them. Peter gives his readers a Jewish title, the Dispersion. In Greek the word is diaspora, even though they would have included many Gentiles. Just as the Jews were dispersed all over the world, so Christians were a dispersion. The name emphasizes that they were misfits. Peter calls them aliens and strangers. Even today, one of the problems when you become a Christian is that you become a misfit. Nowhere in scripture does it say that when you become a Christian, your troubles will disappear. In fact, your troubles will get worse. Peter says this in 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own position, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have been called out of darkness and put into a position of illumination. And we should expect to face hostility, because we have chosen to live under the rule of a different king, Jesus Christ. At the end of this letter, Peter says he writes from Babylon. Some theologians say he meant the literal Babylon on the Euphrates River. But most scholars agree that he was using the term that was common in the Christians of that century to refer to Rome. Peter is adopting the tradition of the Old Testament prophets that used the name of Babylon as a symbol for any and every corrupt nation. For Peter and the Christians in Rome, the city had become the new Babylon. This is one of the letters of the New Testament that can be especially helpful to anybody who is going through difficulties. If you are facing the problem of suffering of any kind, then read 1 Peter. If you are wondering what God is doing in the world of our day and what is going to happen to you when faced with all the stress, pressure and uncertainty that awaits us, this is an excellent letter to read because it was written to Christians under similar circumstances. 
Peter begins with the most important fact in the life of any Christian, his relationship to Jesus Christ and the new birth. He says in 1 Peter 1.3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is the greatest event that can ever happen to anyone. Peter goes on to point out here why this is true. He says that there are three things about this decision that are extremely significant that Christians receive from nowhere else. Firstly, Christians have a living hope. 1 Peter 1, 3-4 should be an encouragement in these hopeless times. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Do you know that you have a place in heaven already? Peter states that we are born again to a living hope, affirming that salvation is a gift from God. Just as a baby does nothing to be born, we experience rebirth not because of who we are or anything that we have done. We are born of God through Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Salvation changes who we are, making us dead to sin and alive to righteousness in Jesus Christ. This new birth serves as our reason for hope. The Assurance of Salvation When you see young people who should be filled with a sense of life and living, lying around like zombies because they have nothing to do, nowhere to go, nothing to live for, then you can see what a living hope does. It activates us. It motivates us. Unlike the empty dead hope of this world, this living hope is energizing, alive and active in the soul of the believer. The New Living Translation says that we live in great expectation. Our living hope has its source in a living resurrected Savior. Peter's living hope was Jesus Christ. Secondly, Peter says that we not only have a living hope, but we have a present power. And we are guarded by that power. 1 Peter 1.5 says, Who, by God's power, are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Christians have a power that sustains them. It holds us when we are anxious or have a need, and this power strengthens us. In spite of all the obstacles that life throws at us, the word guarded here is a military term. It implies that Christians are garrisoned by the power of God and are safeguarded by the Father himself. The third thing that Peter says Christians have in Christ is a rejoicing love. He says so in verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. I hope all of you understand what Peter is talking about here. Despite the fact that he denied Jesus three times and had so many faults and weaknesses, the love that he had for Jesus was genuine and deep. Peter knew that even though most of these Christians in Asia Minor hadn't physically met Jesus, they still had a kind of quiet joy that fills the heart inside, not because of anything he did for them, but because Jesus is and they loved him in return, even though they could not see him. Peter goes on to say after this, that all this had been predicted by the Old Testament prophets. This was not something dreamed up or imagined, but it was predicted, and occurred exactly as they said it would, and thus we can rest upon it. In this way, Peter encourages us. So all Christians have an inner witness and an outer testimony. These are the grounds that Christian faith always rests on, during any age and at any time. From verse 13 of chapter 1, Peter goes on to show us that growing out of these three facts, a living hope, a present power, and a rejoicing love, there will be certain noticeable changes in our lives. He is essentially saying that, if this is what we are, then what we do will confirm that. Otherwise, it has not really happened to us. All that Peter says is, 
Be what you are. That is all. Do not be hypocrites. That has been something that you are not. The first thing that Peter says will occur is that we will be holy. In 1 Peter 1, 4-16 it says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now what do you think when you hear that word holy? Do you think of someone who is so pious that he is always talking about religious things and trying to act perfectly? The Old Testament refers to holiness in a very unique way. It calls it the beauty of holiness. In Psalm 29, Psalm 96 and Psalm 110. There is something beautiful about a holy person because holiness means wholeness. The ingredients of wholeness are devotion and single-mindedness. When I was a small boy, my mother went out and bought me a cup. It was brightly painted and had a big letter D on it. It was my cup and I drank all my cool drink, milk and tea out of it. No one else was allowed to drink out of it. It was my cup. It wasn't a particularly expensive cup. It was actually quite common and ugly, but it was a cup that was wholly devoted to me. I know I struggled at first to understand what being holy was. I tried to be perfect and tried to not do anything wrong. I had completely the wrong idea of the beauty of holiness. The Holy Spirit had to remind me of that little brightly coloured, ugly cup that I had as a child. It wasn't expensive or perfect, but that cup was dedicated for my exclusive use, and that made it unique and special. That is what God requires from each of us. He needs us to be holy, wholly dedicated to His purposes alone. And that is what makes holiness beautiful. This is that same quality that a Christian who knows the Lord Jesus should have. A Christian should be holy, in the sense that he is dedicated. He is at peace with himself. He is not struggling with anyone. He is at rest. He is well adjusted. He does not get upset when everything around him starts crumbling apart. Furthermore, a truly holy person is interested in you. He is not always thinking about himself and his likes and concerns and his own comfort. He is thinking about yours and how you are doing. They are the most attractive kind of people to be around. This is what I think holiness is. The second thing that Peter says Christians should be is, be fearful. Since you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. This is 1 Peter 1 verses 17 to 19. What does Peter mean when he says we should be fearful? He means having a true respect for the kind of being God is. Remember whom you are dealing with. You are not dealing with just another man who can be fooled by your actions and words. You are dealing with the one who knows you more intimately than you know yourself. And he is no respecter of persons. You cannot gain his favor. You cannot become his favorite. God does not act that way. So that kind of being that knows us so well should frighten you. That is what Peter means. Conduct yourself with fear. You are dealing with one whom you cannot fool. Therefore, be honest, remembering that you have been bought, not with common things men use in the market, but with something that no one else could have given, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, because we belong to him, Peter tells us to be priests in 1 Peter 2 verses 4 to 5. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
This is the answer to the question that many people ask today. What did Jesus mean when he said to Peter, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We know that the word Peter, Cephas in Aramaic, means rock, and the Roman Catholic Church would tell us that Jesus meant that he was going to build his church upon Peter. Peter in this verse tells us that this is not true. He was there, so he ought to know what Jesus said. Peter is saying, Jesus is the rock, and every believer who comes to Christ is like a stone built upon that rock, the great foundation rock on which God is erecting the building called the church. Jesus is that rock, and we are built up on him like stones upon the great rock, in order that we might be a priesthood, so that we can offer him spiritual sacrifices. There is something that God greatly desires and wants, but what can you give God that he wants that he doesn't have? What can we, mere human beings in this great universe, give to a God who spoke the universe into being? The answer is in verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is what God wants. He wants us to talk about what he has done for us and tell others what he is like to us. When we do so, we offer a sacrifice of worship unto God that is pleasing and acceptable to him. In the next episode, we will learn the secret of dealing with unjust or unforeseen suffering that grips the hearts of so many Christians today. How do we survive through those troubles? How do we walk in holiness and hope as people of faith? This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 7. Episode 7.